So as you know, last week we were on location. This week we come back from location and Tim shows us how he sorts those files out and how he manages his workload. Now what we're going to do is cross to Tim literally taking the files from his card reader, from his camera and showing how he goes about the process of sorting his work out and then being able, of course, to present it to client. Hey Tim. G'day Mike. So we're back with sand between our toes with our shots from Balmoral. What are, what are we going to do now? Well, I've got the card here. I'm really excited about getting the photos into the computer and starting work on them. So putting the card in the card reader, you're going to use Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, which automatically comes up with an import photos dialog box. So I'll quickly run through the options here to bring our photos into the computer. We're going to copy the photographs as digital negatives. I'll okay. tell you something about that in a minute. Uh, I'll just choose to put them on the desktop in this case. And we're going to organize them into folders by date. And it's year first to then month and day, so our photos will be uh, always easily uh, searchable. Uh, I'm going to rename the files as they come in. I don't want to clutter my computer with thousands and thousands of file names, all with those meaningless camera file names. So I'm going to going to use a custom file name. Uh, first of all, we're going to prefix each file with the date. I'm going to start with the year. To separate that, I'm going to add an underscore. Then I'm going to add my own name to the file name. So now, that now, why add your name at that point? Is that well, all the files from here on in will have wherever they go will have my name in them. And, and yeah, no, that's good <laughs> if I business. email them to someone, send them, so put them in a library, wherever they go. They'll have my file name, my, my name in the file name, yep. and then I'm going to add the file name number suffix, which okay. is the four digit number that was in the file name in the card. Okay. So that completes the file naming. I'll click done to that. So we've got a location organized by date. I've got some file names. Now, what about metadata? Because obviously you're getting some metadata from the camera, but do you add any more at this point? Yes, I do. In the, in the metadata, I'm going to add my contact information. So every photograph, no matter where it goes, will have my contact details, my name and address, and, uh, and copyright. So now, <laughs> it's times like this that, that, that you uh, appear naturally as a professional photographer as opposed to <laughs> me who would never have thought to do that. That's a good point. Well, it's always handy to have some reference about where the photographs came from. Now yeah, I've right. got a template set up here yeah. which simply shows my name and address in, in the correct one, here we are, simply shows my name and address and at this point I can add and make a new template for any particular uh, facts about the shoot. Uh, for example, we know this was shot at a place called Balmoral, so I'm going to add that to the location. You can add further details down there. Now, having done that, I'm going to save those changes to Wheeler Studios and I can make further changes to that. Sure. I can also add some keywords. Now, keywords, metadata are a little bit similar. The keywords are a searchable item that we can put in the database. And the keywords we would add to this, we already know the locations in the metadata, but we can add the word beach and coast and harbour, items that might be worthwhile in a searchable database if you're looking for generic photos of those sorts of things. So having made all those settings in the import dialog box, we'll just go ahead down the bottom right here and click import. Now Mike, you know I said I was going to convert these to digital negatives and import. Oh yeah, now what did you mean by that? Now a digital negative is a universal raw image format. Uh, uh, developed, what do you mean as opposed to the specific one? What, what was the, was it a Canon? What this particular it? camera was a, a Fuji. Fuji, right. Uh, but whether it's Canon or Fuji, uh, they each have their own raw data format that they use to save their files. Right. Now, it might be the case that in the future, other software doesn't support uh, the older raw data formats. So I'm converting everything to Adobe's digital negative format which we expect to be a universal raw format that can be accessed by any number of programs and well into the future. Right, and if Adobe did change it, it's likely Adobe would have some kind of backward compatibility because mm. it's Adobe, right? They certainly would. 
digital negative is the preferred uh, camera, the preferred data format at the moment. It also happens that the Adobe's digital negative format reduces the file size. Oh, really? I don't know. That. Now, this particular camera generates raw files at about 12 megabytes uh, per file, yep. and uh, in digital negative, we'll expect to find them at about about half that size. Hmm. And, but in terms of latitude and anything I want to do to it, it's still just as easy to think of it as equivalent to the absolutely the raw files. All, still, all the raw data from the original uh, capture in the camera, all the information uh, recorded on the chip, is here in the digital negative, and we'll be able to process them and play with them in Lightroom or in Photoshop just the same as if we had uh, used the original camera file. Now you could have imported these with something like Bridge or something else, but uh, any particular reason why you like Lightroom? Yes, I, Lightroom has a f fabulous uh, interface to choose and edit the photographs. And in a, for a lot of images like this, where we're not going to do a lot of specific uh, image editing work, uh, Lightroom is the preferred uh, program for me to enable me to quickly choose and sort and catalog these images. Hmm. We could use Adobe Bridge, which would do a similar thing, but uh, it looks a look, uh, Bridge and Photoshop could be a bit of overkill for this particular job. And would this then be the library of choice for you just, I mean, does it go from this to another library management system or is this your library management system now? Uh, I would use Lightroom as my entire library management system. Uh, it will keep track of uh, almost endless database of images and to be able to recall them. If I eventually archive these to um, external hard drives or removable disks, um, Lightroom will keep a track of the files for me. Oh, so if I copied it off to an external FireWire drive, would it know that it's on that? I mean, it would actually know that it's there even if that FireWire drive is not plugged in? Well, that's right. It'll keep a uh, thumbnail in the database yep. uh, in the Lightroom catalogue, and then uh, you'll access the original file from that FireWire drive. Right. Would it know which? What if I had more than one FireWire drive? Uh, no, it, it wouldn't tell you actually which drive it's on. Right. But if we were to place them in folders on those FireWire drives that contained the drive number, then right, the, path, okay. the path to that file would be recorded. Right, so if I had a drive called uh, the, uh, I don't know, the 07 August 07 drive or something, and I put that in the file name, then I would know that way rather than it. That's right. Lightroom sort of, would tell you that yeah. the last uh, time it saw that file, it was on a drive, uh, it was on a path which, it, which had that uh, folder name in it and uh, so you could go and find that particular drive. Okay, so that seems to have uh, loaded up. Yep, they're all in there now, Mike. And the next process I'd like to do is a little bit of editing. We shot a whole heap of stuff down there on the beach and I've got a total of 216-odd uh, photographs in here. And I can quickly scroll through the thumbnails like this and show you a bit of the range of them. But I'm going to do an edit in a different way. I'm going to use the survey mode for some so that I can really narrow down my choice to the ones that I want to put in the final gallery. Uh, so in a rough scroll here, I really like the ones we shot early on of the water moving over the rocks. Oh, uh, with the longer exposure? Can yeah. I see those bigger? Or how does yep, that you can. I'm going to, going to select uh, all the ones of the same yep. shot at the same time, the same sequence, and choose Survey View. Now, Survey View makes all the loads all the images as thumbnails into the main part of the window and I'll just click away the panels to get rid of those. And in survey view here, well they're not actually much bigger than the thumbnails we had down the bottom. But the survey view is really fantastic because as I hover over each little photo I get a, an X. When I click the X I don't want that one, it disappears and all the rest of the images shuffle around and as I reduce the number of Im images that uh, we see on the screen, the uh, the pictures that are left there will get slightly larger and continue to fill the screen to help narrow down my choice. So I'm not quite sure of these ones. The water's a bit sharp on those. I was really looking for a more blurry look, although I quite like the splash on that one. This one looks a little bit dark, so I'll get rid of that one. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, now you can see. I've got uh, six here that I really quite like. These two at the top and the middle are uh, quite uh, similar, and I prefer the middle one, so I'll get rid of that. And uh, 
Now, that one there in the top middle, yeah, that really looks like it's, it's a completely different set of water, right? But it's just that the water's all flattened out by the longer exposure, right? That's right. A longer shutter speed, and during the time the shutter speed, the shutter was open, the water's splashed in and out a little bit, and we've got a blurry okay. uh, motion from the water. I'll show you in a moment how we can determine what the exposure was. So when we want to go back and do more of that, we can recall what we did. Uh, but it, just in the meantime, I, I think that might actually be the, the final one I want. Perhaps just those three are the, uh, the final ones I want. And so having made the selection down to those three, yep. I'm going to go back to grid mode and the three particular images that I have so ended up selecting in survey view uh, highlighted in my uh, grid of thumbnails there. Now, will that, will that sort of persist if I did another survey view? No, those three will come back if we go back into survey view, but what I'm going to do at this stage is give them a, a one star rating. Okay. Now, I'm just hitting one on the keyboard, <coughs> which will set the rating to one. So later on, when we edit our shoot down to just those images with stars, we'll be able to see these and the other ones will disappear momentarily. Right, so you're going to like effectively filter via via star rating? Via star. Okay. So this, this blurry one that we spoke about a moment ago, I'll just bring that up on a big screen looking at in uh, loop view and I really want to see what the actual shutter speed was when we shot that. Now we'll find that in the metadata field over in the right hand pane here. Yep. And as we scroll down in the metadata, I see the camera capture information right here. That was taken at one second at f36. So I've stopped the aperture right down to a small hole, and the equivalent exposure time to make the correct exposure was uh, one second. Mm -hmm. Now, during that one second, the water's splashed in and out a little bit and created a nice soft blur uh, to the water. So I'll remember that one second next time I go to the beach and shoot. Going back to my uh, grid mode uh, here, uh, I'll just scroll through and select uh, some other pictures that I quite like. We shot some across the rocks to the pavilion on the beach. And uh, in these ones, uh, do you recall, we talked about uh, changing the depth of field. So we had the rocks in the foreground in focus in some and the building behind in focus in the other. So I'm just going to select two of those and choose a, another way of viewing them which is the compare view. Now compare view takes the two images up puts them side by side. And I can see that my left hand uh, image here has a nice sharp uh, detail in the rocks in the foreground but out of focus in the background and the opposite is here. So I think what I might do later on in Photoshop is combine these two to create a sharp in the foreground and sharp in the background effect for us. So I'm going to mark both of those with a star and we'll process those in Photoshop later on. The reason I go into Photoshop in those, Mike, actually, that, that's one thing that Lightroom can't do, is actually work in layers, work in multiple layers within the image to mask out parts of one image and reveal parts of another. So at this stage, though, in, in Lightroom, we're just going to carry forward and edit uh, down to some of our other photographs. I quite like the stone with some light and shade of the uh, yeah, nice. rock there and the detail. So I'm going to give that one star. There's some other rock ones I think I saw as the, as the camera was yep. loading that look pretty cool. Yes, we've, we've shot some more interesting rock ones. These ones in particular yeah, really nice. look fantastic. Now, I've made a quite a bit of a difference in exposure here on these ones. So again, I'm going to select my group of four images here and put them in our survey view again to see which the best exposure might be. I'm going to bring up my right hand pane here because this contains our histogram. Yep. You know, we might have talked about it at the time. It's a representation of the brightness values of the picture. And uh, I'd like to see some detail in that rock but make sure it's not too uh, blown out and too burnt out to white. So I think this first one could be a little bit overexposed. So I click on the second one, the histogram is generated and I don't have that strong uh, bright area of pixels up against the uh, right hand wall of the histogram there. This guy alternatively looks absolutely too dark and I've got a lot of the histogram bunched up against the left hand wall. Mm -hmm. So I think my exposure there is a little bit too dark. And the last one, 
has a few highlights here that are blown out to uh, highlights to white at the at the end so I think it might be a little bit light so I guess our second one ultimately is the choice that's the one we'll use uh, it's the best exposure that's and that the was one. what quarter of a second at f22 that's right and it was quite uh, although the sun's up it was uh, quite a uh, you know still quite low in the uh, sky there mm -hmm. and so the uh, the camera determined a, a quarter of a second at f22 and we look like we have a spot on exposure with that one i'm going to rate that one star and then go back to our grid mode I'll just choose some others to put in our library at the end of the day. Some really interesting shapes and patterns in these two as well. So we'll just quickly go through and select a range of these. There's some really interesting shapes in this rock. It's just so well formed by the action of the wind and the ocean on the rock that there's some lovely shapes there. Then a little bit of influence of man. So these shots show a end of the retaining cables for the swimming net and I'm going to put those back into survey view and let's choose these. Now uh, Mike when I shot these I changed the focus. In the first one here we see we're focused in on the old rusty column at the, in the foreground and out of focus in the rocks behind. And yeah you really see it in that chain at the bottom don't you as the chain That's right. There's defines a the, fabulous uh, depth of field or lack of depth of field that highlights the the column and the chain and uh, softens the rock. Where the rock goes sharp and the chain goes unsharp, where our focus is more on the rock, I'm not so wild about that view. So I'm going to get rid of that. We'll just lose this panel on the right, make things a little bit bigger. And now I can see very clearly how well these work together. I think these ones with a bit more chain in the foreground is the go, so we'll yeah. lose the ones without. I'd agree with that. And then, ex then some nice uh, exposure, I think, about the middle one would be the way to go. So if I lose each of those and leave that one remaining image with a star rating of one. Now are you just really harsh on yourself in that you only give any of your work one star or is there some that you're leaving room to come back and rate them higher later? Yes, I'm going to leave some room to rate them higher. Across the entire database, I would choose one star as the keepers for the shoot. Yep. I won't delete the other images, but I'll just keep the one star as the chosen ones then if I've a bit undecided I might give several images one star and then later on I can come back to it and from amongst those one star images I could always give preferred ones two stars or well maybe even three stars <laughs> if I was really feeling generous. Now while we were down there that morning Ooh, that there was looks nice. a, yeah, what's that? Some, some boys were playing on the rocks. I'm going to select a bunch of these and put them back into our survey mode again. Let's just concentrate on the ones with the boys playing on the rocks. So there's, uh, we'll get rid of those ones. And I've added a few too many here into my survey mode, which isn't unusual. Now, let's see. Yeah, they've got our back to our camera here, so we'll lose that one. I can't recall, did, they, did you have any filtering on this? Was there a polarizer or? No, no, these were straight, no filter on the camera and just a uh, average blue, metering isn't exposure. It? Yeah, it was a very clear day, nice crisp blue sky. Now, is it possible at this point to just look at one of those up large without actually just, I mean, let's say that one, the third from the top, which looks nice, can I just sort of zoom it up to have a look at it? Or is it yep, the only way to right. do that? To if we have a quick look that one, at that one in our loop view, it fills the screen, but if you notice in the thumbnail list down the bottom, the other ones we had selected in survey view are still right. highlighted. And then we can see, even with our magnifier here, that as he was swinging off the rock, the image is slightly uh, blurry. It just needs to res up into a uh, high, uh, clear resolution. There we go. So he's slightly blurring. His feet are slightly blurred. He's swung off the rock. I don't think that's a problem. I click again to reduce it. And I quite like the boys hanging out here in the empty space with all this texture in the rock. And I can give it one star, and I can still go back into survey mode and see if there's anything of the others that I, I quite like. So I quite like the bit of action here. We'll give him one star. And this one doesn't look sharp for some reason, but a bit difficult to see when it's small. So I'll bring him up into loop view and I see, in fact, that I'm entirely out of focus there. So I don't know what happened there. I must have gone to sleep for a moment. <laughs> Something, uh, something went awry. But that's one we're not going to use. So in survey mode, I'll just get rid of that. 
I mean, really, the secret of good photography, or not necessarily the secret, but certainly one of the contributing aspects of good photography, is to take a lot of photos, right? Yes, in this sort of situation, it was something that was just happening in front of me, and I didn't direct them or have control yeah. of it. So I was just shooting a number of shots as they were clowning around, and uh, I knew some, as I'm shooting, I know some will be better than others, but you're not quite sure what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, the real advantage of shooting digital, of course, is that we can just keep shooting frame after frame and then use this uh, fabulous process in Lightroom to toss away the ones we don't like. I quite like the tussle here, so we'll give that one star. Then let's go back to our grid mode and see if we can't select some other interesting pictures. There's some more fabulous rock and uh, texture images here, which I quite like. And I could even select a number of individual images uh, like this and then give them all one star together. Mm -hmm. So I've made a brief selection of these frames, Mike, and in our toolbar across the bottom I can filter our view based on a star rating. So if I click on our one star here, we only see the images that I've selected with one star. Okay. You're not deleting the others, we're just... just no, they're, they're still yeah. there and in fact in our indicator line down here we can see that we have three selected uh, they're the highlighted ones. We have 18 that we're viewing in the window of our 216 images that we imported from the card. Right. And if I wanted to see those thumbnails a bit bigger, that's a variable size thumbnail. Thumbnails it? are variable in size. We can drag them up a, to quite a reasonable size. Always a little bit of an awkward thing. I like to th see the thumbnails as big as possible, but I like to see all the images at the same time. Yeah, so, so I'm in internal conflict less of a thumbnail now and more of a uh, individual load. images yeah. so we can see that as a group this might hang together pretty well now Mike we've chosen our images but now I really want to just tweak them a little bit make them a little bit more interesting okay and for that we're going to use the develop module now the develop module allows us to take one individual image or a bunch and then change the color balance and the brightness and the contrast and so on. So down here on the right hand side we can see we've got some color balance adjustments and then some tonal adjustments. Further down we can play with an actual tone curve or even convert to grayscale and change the color and, and so on. So I think we'll start with a, the basic color adjustment here. This is a it's blue because there's a lot of sky that's reflecting in it. So I'm just going to drag the color temperature slider to see if increasing the intensity of their blue doesn't create a more interesting effect. I think that stronger color helps quite a lot. So I've changed the color balance here. Now Lightroom has an interesting auto feature. It's a bit like auto levels or auto curves in Photoshop. And I quite often quick auto just to see what's going to happen. And usually, I don't like it. But <laughs> what Auto has done is stretched our details in the histogram, putting the brights up a little bit brighter and taking the darks down and made them a little bit darker. Eh, I think we've lost a lot in that. So I can use the, uh, holding the option or alt key, the tone word changes to reset tone, and I can reset that back so, to So original. what was the hot key you are holding then? Sorry. Uh, the option on the Mac or Alt on the PC. Right. I might manually tweak the exposure or the uh, brightness in this case. Uh, I don't know that I really want to make it that much brighter. I like a dark, moody sort of thing. So we want, maybe want to increase the blacks in it. Well, that looks nice, doesn't it? And that's adding a little bit of contrast to it. Um, perhaps tweak the brightness down a little bit. I'll leave the contrast where it is. Now, Lightroom has a couple of terrific tools too for adjusting the uh, color. Now, Clarity is a fabulous new slider that is effectively like making a mid-tone contrast adjustment. So it just drag the clarity up a little bit and all of a sudden the image starts to pop. Those little bit of sharp areas are really popping and the and the smoothness in the uh, water is still evident. Vibrance and saturation, well, uh, not really much here. It's a pretty monotonal thing. If you wanted to increase the blue in it, it looks a bit false, increasing the vibrance, so we'll leave that where it is. 
Yeah, it looks like there was uh, clouds reflected, so we haven't even got... I mean, I know, I know it went full blue sky later in the morning, but uh, that looks like it's got some whites, and that's breaking up the blue, which is nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that's worked quite well. We might make a lens correction here too, and I often do this as a quick way if we're processing in Lightroom rather than Photoshop, and that is to use the lens vignetting slider. Now, originally intended to counteract uh, faults with lenses, if lenses are a little bit dark in the... Uh, have a bit of light drop off and they're a bit yeah. dark in the corners. The idea with the lens vignette is that you would correct that using the slider here. Whereas in fact, if we drag it the other way and we go left, what it does is it really darkens the corners of the picture. Right. And we can just drag a bit midpoint to make the center of the picture, uh, the, yeah, the center of the vignetting uh, smaller. And so we've really darkened it off to a quite dramatic it's much more dramatic, tone it? at the edge. So I think that's looking nice. Now, we might go through and do similar things with other. Is there, is there any way that we know of to just take those settings and reapply mm -hmm. them to a bunch of other photos? Or? Absolutely. It's a computer, Mike. We'd expect it to be able to do things automatically. Uh, so if you were to select a number of images in the yep. thumbnail row down the bottom, you can synchronize the settings. Now, synchronizing brings up a dialog box that we can choose which settings we want to synchronize between our chosen image and the other two that we've added to that selection. Then we're going to click synchronize and all the settings in the first image will then be uh, copied across to the second. When we look at them we might find, well individually they might have gone a little bit too dark. So in our basic tone we might brighten up a little bit of the middle of one of these and I think that's gone way too contrasty yeah, in this particular case. So I might just reset the tone of that one and start again. So sometimes when you copy across the settings it works, mm, sometimes not. I can imagine that can save a lot of time though, the, um, being able to copy those settings around. Well it does. If we do a Command or Control A and select all the images in our selection uh, in the thumbnail strip down the bottom, then we can synchronize those settings right across the board. Okay. These shots vary quite a lot, so I won't be doing it yeah. to those. There's another little tip here which is hidden away. I don't know why it's hidden, but if you uh, command or control click the sync, sync, it turns into auto sync. So clicking that retains the auto sync, and then any changes I make to one image will be made to all the images oh, so automatically. Oh, so it sort of like links them on oh, moving forward. I don't need to manually sync. Oh, that's cool. A uh, number of frames. So if I was to process uh, a whole folder of images that were all shot in a similar situation, then I could auto-sync, make one colour setting change to one image, and it would just process the same colour changes to all the images in the, mm. in the selection. Now, let's see if we can't find these boys swinging on the rock and do something nice with them. I'll get rid of our left pane here by clicking that way and we can see our image quite a little bit bigger. Well, oh, that looks pretty right as is. This clarity will help make it pop. What's clarity kind of doing? I mean, it's making it pop, but is it, uh, is it like a contrast or is it a...? It's a mid-tone contrast. It's kind of like using an unsharp mask with a very low percentage and a high radius. Okay. It was a little bit of a tweak in Photoshop using unsharp masks in a way that wasn't initially intended. Yep. But there's a whole bunch of people who, even more geeky than me, they've gone around and found all variations to settings of things that they uh, that, that different to what was originally intended and have come up with some fantastic results. So much so that this clarity was uh, idea was uh, developed and put into uh, Lightroom 1.1. So that's really given it some fabulous mid-tone sharpness and mid-tone contrast. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Well, I think we've got an interesting range of images here. We'll perhaps fiddle with things like lens corrections in some of them, darken off the edges, make things look a little bit dramatic. And maybe just for one we might... Uh, turn it into a black and white for a bit of a demonstration. How'd that grab you? Yeah, that, that, some of these rock faces look really nice with uh, black and white. Numbers. Really, really strong in tones in black and white. But I guess the important thing here is black and white isn't a colour picture with saturation turned to zero. Not in Lightroom it isn't. 
Uh, it used to be in other programs. <laughs> Uh, just knocking the colour saturation out of each of the red and the green and the blue channels is never a great look for a digital image. In Lightroom, we can have a fabulous way of adjusting individual colours uh, to transpose into different amounts of grey. Our grayscale mix on the right here is uh, giving us the ability to individually adjust the tones that certain colours come out in the grey. So I would say that the yellows and the, the greens here and possibly the, the oranges need to be a little bit lighter. So some of that darkness in the, in the stone there, we've picked up a bit more contrast and separation in those. So you could manually do it by adjusting the sliders. But the thing that really interests me, Mike, is this little dot here. Oh, it's that allows me to adjust individual colors within the image. So if I click on the stone here and pull the mouse down, it's reducing Because when, when you were looking colors. before, I was thinking you might want to play with the sky, and I was thinking, I wonder if the sky is registering as blue or aqua. Well, that's exactly that's right. That's what this it, is for, I guess. Especially once you're in black and white, yeah. uh, you might not remember all the colors in the picture. So clicking the adjustment within the photograph can allow me to darken just the blues in the image. How cool is that? And it's actually, as you see, adjusting blue and a little bit of purple. Isn't that cool? uh, so that's just just changing the, the one particular colour in the way that it transfers into a grey. So we can adjust one colour as opposed to the other. So I think that's looking a little bit more dramatic. Now I guess the advantage of working with RAW files is that if we are going to black and white, we're ending up with more than... Like we've gone to JPEG, we only have 256 grayscale, but you're getting no band in here because the RAW file really is working at a fairly decent bit depth. That's right. It's a high bit depth, so as I start to make the adjustments like this, we're not going to get any of that horrible tonal dropout. Because there which was would no leave banding that, on that sky, wasn't Leave it? that banding yeah. uh, appearing in... Uh, curves across the sky here, which is the kind of thing where the pixels of the image don't have enough information, and when I start tweaking them in low bit depth, they start to just drop out. So we have some light stuff at the bottom, and then some mid-tone, and then some darker stuff, and you can Steffy. see those horrible banding lines yep. between. But I see, though, that I've got a spot. It could be dust on the chip, but that'd be black. So okay. I reckon that there's something white up there in the sky, and I'm not really that wild about it. So I'm going to get rid of it. Oh, so we actually have some, we some have edit some, tools in... Um... We have some clone and heal, and in, in Lightroom, I'm going to just zoom into that, that spot. There it is, and oh, I might have been a bird or something like that. Now my uh, re remove spots tool, <laughs> which... It's a bit like a rubber stamp or a clone stamp tool. Yep. Uh, we've got a choice between clone and heel. In the sky, cloning would do fine. I'm just going to reduce my brush size. A little tip here, Mike, it's the square bracket key, left and right, for smaller or larger brush size. Now, in Lightroom, we don't have to select the source to clone like we do in Photoshop. Just click on the spot and drag beside it. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a really quick and easy way to um, remove the spot, but it's left the, the rings there showing us where we've cloned. If I go back to uh, develop mode, the rings disappear, the spots disappear, and then I'll just zoom back out, which is Command or Control minus, to take me into full view, oh. and now there it's gone. Just for my money, just and I know this is a horrendous thing to say to you, you composed the shot, but I'd like to see us crop off a little bit on camera right just so we've got like he's a little bit more shifted to the right by losing a bit of rock on the right and a bit more sky to the left. Yeah, I, think I presume that's, that's a crop tool down there. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a crop tool here. I think that's probably fair enough, Mike. I was going to mention it too that oh, I was a little bit wobbly cyclist on that uh, day and I see the horizon's a bit tilted over. Right. So our crop tool can fix that for us. Um, we can pull it in here on the left. You know, the real advantage, oh, I've got to tell you, I love this. The real advantage about cropping in Lightroom is that when you do crop the image in or rotate it, the crop rectangle stays square on the screen. So for those of us who have been working for years in Photoshop and having an image, and when we go to rotate the crop, it's just the crop rectangle itself rotates. Yep. 
And we've got to try and tilt our head on the side like this to see if that looks like it. it would be square or not. I always found that a bit tricky. So we'll just line that up to the uh, horizon. Yep. A little tip here is if I bring that bottom line right up to the horizon, I can keep it nice and square and then just drag it back down to where I, where I want it. So I think you're right, Mike. That looks like a little bit I just love that more uh, interest, rule a little bit of more thirds tension. of, uh, and obviously the rule of thirds is sort of built into that grid there, isn't it? It is. There's a rule of thirds, and as yeah. we rotate the image, we yeah. get a smaller grid, and that allows me to see the line up. So we'll bring it up, leave a little bit of height in there, and as we're moving it, the, the crop rectangle stays square, and I can move the image within our crop rectangle. Now, I quite like that little bit of tension we've got bringing that yeah keep close to the side there yeah and she's nice and square to the now if you let's say I, I asked you to lock that off and and sort of effectively buy that um, does it crop the file or does it crop the display of the file and if we change our mind later we can go back to it it's the second one absolutely when I go back to look at the full view it's our cropped image yep now from that we could tweak it in black and white more, we can yep. play with it, we could give it a rating, we could export it and do all sorts of wonderful things with it, whatever you want. Every time we went back into that file and clicked on our crop overlay, all our original camera data is still there. So the way Lightroom works is it doesn't actually crunch any of the pixels in the camera. Okay. So we've not, we're not going to lose any data at any time, even though I've gone to black and white. Cool. We can we can go back to color. Easily go back to color, and it's all still there. Okay, so let's say now that we've got uh, some we've turned to black and white. We've picked out the ones we want. Is there any way to? You mentioned before something about uh, a gallery. Is there any way to like? Um, yeah, I would like to. That? You know, so excited by some of these pictures we're taking. I really want to share them with the world. Or perhaps the paid client. <laughs> well, they might want to see some as well. Uh, so. We could make a slideshow, we could print them out, or we could throw them up on the web. Let's put them up on the web and that way anyone can see them. I'm going to click on the web module and it opens a completely different set of windows for us. We have two panes left and right and our web gallery in the middle. Lots of controls here, Mike. Where should we start? Well, I probably, I probably won't get us to do too much on this because I think we could probably spend almost a class just on on this bit. But but why don't you do what you might do if I if you and I working together and we wanted to send it to a client, a sort of a, a, a sensible minimum mm. set, and and uh, we'll assume that we can go further from there. Okay. Well, I to start with, I'm going to make a web gallery and upload it to part of my website and email that link to my client so he can see it. Uh, site title. I've never done a job called site title. <laughs> But if I do, it's already there for me. Let's call it Beach Days. They are indeed my photographs. And we can edit the, the sure. uh, subtitles here. OK, so we'll just change the description here. And uh, I'm going to call this one my gallery of beach pics. Yep. Now, I kind of like the way the gallery looks. It's neat here with the grey surround. There's a little bit of drop shadow behind each one. Uh, when you click on one image, what'll happen is that'll come up big in the screen, and then the client will be able to scroll through or go back to the index. This is have a heap of time, wouldn't it, in just getting client review? Absolutely. Uh, it's a fantastic thing, especially right down at the bottom here for the upload settings. I can enter my uh, FTP server name with my username and password here. Oh, and, and it just does it straight path. from the program up to the, um, to the site? Once that's done and I click Upload, then the entire HTML gallery, including index.html, which is the file that opens it, and the associated folders will be uploaded to that path on my website. And I can email my client the link and say, here are my beautiful pickies. Well, look, thanks so much for walking us through that, Tim. And uh, we'll obviously post some of these pictures outside the, uh, the class so that people can actually see them without the uh, artifacts of the... Uh, obviously, you know, we're viewing this with the, the actual compression of the QuickTime. 
Um, but yeah, no, it's nice photography. I, I'm annoyed because I was standing right beside you and your photos look so much better than some that I took on my camera, but there you go. That's the, that's the eye of experience for you. Uh, but thanks. Thanks, Mike. Okay, this week's project, it's a little harder. Some of you may not be able to do this, but if you can, it would be great. What we'd like you to do is present a client page on a website. Now, it's a little hard to do if you don't have access to your own website to put up. You might be able to use the Mac one, but ideally we'd like you to do your own page. If you can't do your own page because clearly you don't have access to a website that you control, then simply make it up in Photoshop as a mock single page and then post that in our forum. What we're going to do now is look at the impression that a client would get from looking at your work, give you the feedback on the messages that you're sending and how you present work to clients. So send me a URL or post in the forums the actual sort of JPEG snapshot of the mock-up of a single client page. One page only. Don't do a whole website, just one page with, uh, you know, obviously proxies for the photos that you're doing. I don't care what photos you use, you can use anything from earlier classes or whatever, but if you can post that in the forums, Tim and I'll get back to you. Until next week, I'm Mike Seymour, I'll see you then, bye.